uh, or sort of left off earlier on. What I want to do is really to just look at how is there, is there other ways that we can change our thinking about how we interact with our students, whether online or whether face to face, which I think for probably most of us is probably our preferred one, because you know we know that we can do more face to face with suitable backup and connection to interesting resources, uh, which is kind of useful. And so I want to basically have a look at a little bit of input, kind of a bit like I actually run my face-to-face -face stuff. A bit of input, setting a context, setting some questions, and then opening it up to kind of discussion, not just with me, which is our model here, is mostly the discussion back to the presenter. But I want you guys to contribute and discuss and debate yourselves, because some of this stuff is going to be pretty scary. I know when I started it, it was really, truly scary to get out of that comfort zone that I knew my subject. And it took a little while to really begin to understand the important importance of these three little sentences. You see, if we use the traditional lecture approach, and I was told, told this by my colleagues when I first started as an academic back in 2001, 2002, lectures don't work. But hang on, I went to lectures in 1971-2-3 when I was at university, and I kind of survived. So what's different? And it really is interesting, this leaky bucket thing. If you can't keep trying to pour your knowledge into their heads, it comes out of straight both ears, straight off, pretty much. Not much gets caught in the brain. But what I've discovered in the last three years is if I don't bother to teach them the answer to teach them all of my knowledge, get them to research the answers to the question, the material that helps them understand both sides of the question, for some extraordinary reason, that leaky bucket becomes magically healed. And it's really bizarre and really fascinating to see it happen. My most important point is my schedule time, my two, three, four hours a week with a particular group of students for a particular module, is far, far too valuable to waste on the things that they can go read. If they can read it, why on earth should I bother to even kind of tell them about it? Go find. In fact, my modules do not even have book lists. I do not have any recommended reading at all. Although, put a minor mod into one of my modules and my external ex uh, examiner said, Richard, you really need to have at least one recommended book. So I sort of took that with a pinch of salt and well, yeah, I need to help him understand what I'm doing. So the recommended reading is not a textbook, it's the electronic published book works that my students put together each semester. They edit the best work. I, I mark it, get a coma, uh, moderate and so on, and for final year students, anything scoring 70% and above gets edited into the ebook for that module for that year. And that is going to be the recommended reading for the future. Because my modules, anyway, are fairly eclectic in the way I present them, and I expect the students to find answers from left field, from right field, from centre field, anywhere that pulls together a great story, a great analysis. So I want to look very briefly at a problem that we have in the UK, a potential solution, some results, and a little bit of reflection, and then I'll open it up. See, so here we have the traditional approach. We all know we're the domain expert. I mean, how many of us have our subject area in the title of professor of or senior lecturer in? I've changed my in five or six times over the last 12 years, 13 years. I just happen to be, because I'm teaching modules like this, a senior lecturer in analytics and governance. I've been in business, got, uh, lecturing in business, or lecturing in computing, I've got all sorts of titles. So what am I a domain expert of? No, I'm not a domain expert in strategic management of business like one of my colleagues is. 
Now, if we are a domain expert, that's what we believe we've got to do. We're pouring this knowledge. And I remember the modules I used to teach where I spent, you know, three hours a week pouring this incredibly important information into their heads. And they were so seriously bored, and I was so seriously bored. And we also in Britain have a horrible problem with our black minority ethnic and international students typically scoring on average across the piece between 15 and 25% lower marks than our white UK Caucasians. Serious issue. Now switch it to something we were talking about in the way, facilitated learning. I'm an academic who now understands that I don't know any particular domain or subdomain better than my students. In fact, I want them to be better than me. I want to challenge them to become better, to help me learn. So what am I there? Actually, that's my skill, it turns out. Critical thinking and getting people, students, to research, analyse, critical evaluation, and so on. They research and research and research. My modules have almost no BMEI deficit. In fact, in some modules, my black and minority ethnic international students, on average, get a better profile than the white UK Caucasian. And every single year, from first year, in their first eight weeks of being at the university, the best get to publish electronically, online, their work. So they get CV entries of published work. Some of the students get CV entries of editing. How many of your students have three publications to their name by the time they leave the university? How many have got two or three editorial attributions to their name on their CV? So we had this problem of low achiever, and some of my, uh, my students on other modules with different lectures get 20% lower scores. Why? Let's find out. Big deficit and a serious lack of enthusiasm as well. And what I've been doing is get, uh, catch, uh, attracting a lot of attention now within the university, uh, right at the very senior level as uh, Pro Vice Chancellors, uh, some UK research into re reducing the BMEI deficit as well. And it seems to be a whole series of things that are going on. I'm not sure whether this is an exhaustive list or not. But these are some of the things that I'm doing. Research-based, a little bit of context each week. Go find some of the answers or supporting uh, materials that will help you to understand and evaluate and critically evaluate this important question. Like I said this morning, questions in Ardham, in business, in computing, informatics, haven't changed in, 45, in the 40 years that I've been involved with it, 45 years I've been involved with it. Same question, but different answers. When our students go out into the big wide world, they need to be able to identify the important questions. They may even have to generate the questions. We can't teach them all. I give them a lot of skills guidance. I give them an enormous amount of time one-to-one, -one. so a lot of 20 student groups, and I will each week they get an hour with, tw uh, with 20 students, and so I can give a lot of one to one work. I'm almost replicating what I had when I was at Cambridge as an undergraduate. I give them very broad assignment topics. I don't give them a list of topics even like you're doing, I give them a big topic, and then they individually research and negotiate a narrow topic, and that's what they write about. I have some very clear, relevant, simple marking criteria, but they're different from what we usually have. Typically, we would have D is passed, is satisfactory. Okay. C is good, D is very, sorry, B is very good, and A is excellent. How do students understand that at different levels? How things change from level to level? I change that completely, and I'll show you one or two examples. Another critical factor, I get my students to about week eight of a 12-week semester, 
They will come to me on a 15-minute schedule that I publish. They will bring their work, having submitted it to turn it in, so I can actually mark it online, give them the comments online, record it for them. That's what you could call the final draft. Now, some of them do have a pretty good final, final draft there. Some of them only got about half of it done. Doesn't matter. They're marked against the criteria and then told to go away and fix and improve. And they will submit it about four to five weeks later. And they will come back again on a schedule, a 15 minute schedule, and I'll mark it with them there, face to face. They know the mark immediately. None of this waiting for another two weeks. And you know how we slave at home or wherever trying to mark this huge stack of things. The results are quite interesting. I just gave an example, some data I've got here from a, a module that I've just finished marking in the last couple of, uh, week, last week. Two modules which are effectively identical with slightly different learning outcomes, slightly different focus. But I can give them the same broad topic. Last year, it was big data for small and medium-sized enterprises. And for one module, questions of opportunities, challenges, benefits, and operations. That's for enterprise um, systems and questions of ethics, trust, governance, security, audit, and provenance for the information security insurance. And that was the title. That's all they had to go on. So they had to do lots of research to find the real questions, lots of research to find the answer to their question. An, inter an international organization, a publisher down in towards Cambridge area, had a look at the first set, I think it was this set, and they were absolutely bowled over at the quality of the writing. The quality of their assignments, which is about three and a half thousand words roughly, to, that was to the IEEE um, tempo format by the way, is better than most of the uh, academic, art academic articles I peer review for journals. This is final year undergraduates are writing better than most of us do folks. That's kind of worrying, isn't it? Now, what I do is for justi justified on the grounds of employability, among other things, they get 20% of their grades for that article comes from meeting the presentational criteria. They're given a particular for, um, template, whether it's the IEEE template or the Springer LNCS template, they go find it, they go download it, and if they meet it perfectly, plus things like you know, citing and referencing correctly and perfectly, um, and also meeting the stated length. So they will lose 30% for plus zero lines, minus 10 lines. So they've got a 10 line word limit, uh, writing limit for the substantive material. How many of us have written a paper for a conference and thought, oh, I can get away with a half a page over the limit? And it comes back, oh, do you want to pay $100 for that? No. And so I use that experience to explain to them why it's critical to meet that presentation. There is a hard, hard limit. None of this few thousand words, but this is a template because they're going out into the real world, real wide world, and they will have to meet word limit, page limit, whatever. Who cares what the limit is? It's defined. The format, the template is defined. How many, I've used what five different templates this year, I think. Books, a couple of chapters of different things, various different conferences. Just deal with it, guys. And so. Hard 20%. It's great for those who do it and it helps get people out of the failure mode as well because even if they can do that, they get 20% in the bank. It doesn't affect people getting 90 in the high marks on these two topic areas, but it helps the bottom end. What would the IEEE use to do? Because computing, IEEE is one of the big conference the series. Writing, There's a, f a template which is pretty evil actually. For writing CV? Yeah, yeah. But for writing? It's for papers to go to academic, for the IEEE, uh, international, um, 
electronic and engineering. Uh, I know. Yeah, yeah. So I use that template. It's difficult to use. If you can use IEEE or Springer LNCS, you can use almost any template. In fact, actually, you learn not to even write it in the template. You write it in the normal form, uh, sort of uh, way in Word, and then just copy paste special text only into the template, and then start putting all the formatting. It's much easier. I then give them 40% of the grade for argument, 40% for topic, and you'll see I've reworded the criteria very, very differently so they can actually begin to understand. They can use these criteria as well to help judge the quality or the value of their topic area. Is it feasible to get the novelty factor? I give them about 10 or 15 questions that they can ask themselves about what they've got, their research, does it meet such criteria to hit novelty? I'm sorry. And then argument and so on. So it's rather more easy for them to understand what they need to do than good or satisfactory, very good or excellent. It has another benefit. It means that when you end up with all of your grades up in those top three or four bands, there is no argument that you have to downgrade or shift the mean that way. Because it's self-evident that it is at a national workshop level or at an international workshop level. Academics recognize that. So the fact that I've moved my mean and median 15, 20 points to the right compared with where you'd normally expect it to be, it's unarguable kind of interesting concept Some results. Module average is somewhere in the 73 to 78% level. Do any of you have that? Enormously high numbers of, uh, large numbers of cited sources in many of the uh, um, articles that they write. It almost completely eradicates failures, apart from those who totally fail to engage and don't submit. Lots of valuable CV stuff, and it helps develop employability. And of course, you know, using that, picking up what Amri was saying, if you explain what you're doing, why you're doing it, and the benefit to the students, they're going to love it. These are sort of grades, this is final year, final semester grades, profiles. I've had to start using the 95, 85, 75 percent bands rather than the A band of from 70 to 900, because otherwise everybody's in that top end, so it's still pretty much a normal distribution. Ethnicity impact, I'm sorry that for some of you it's not going to be very easy, but you can see <clears throat> just what's going on, the profiles are almost identical between the white, UK, Caucasian and everybody else. You can, won't be able to see this very well, I don't suppose, but <coughs> the mean number of um, cited, cited sources per article, I, per student, is somewhere in the 20s. This is for a 3, 000, just under 3,000 word um, article. Most of our dissertations used only to get that many anyway. Well, the average. Anyway. Now, that one top there, there's 80 sources in that particular article. That's actually quite an exceptional one. But yeah, we're getting up to 40 and 50 sources for a, a 3,000 word assignment. Now, I don't check the quality too hard because I tell them in, in our, the field I'm, we're working here, we need to use a lot of the online sources, the professional sources, because they are up to date. Tech, Tech Republic, that's t which is one of our, our online sources, is publishing stuff that was happening yesterday and today. The things that are keeping chief information officers awake at night today, not what was published in an IEEE conference t last year, which was researched three years before that. So there's lots of things going on here, but you know we're really looking at. Half of the students have got more than 20 sources. Last year we ended up with 
what's that, 70, 81 articles combined into the two books. And there's a link, you can go have a look, they're publicly available. And there's about four or five different e-book e publications there. The feedback, generally pretty good. It is one of the best modules I've ever had. Feedback received was greatly appreciated as it caught out minor mistakes which enabled me to achieve a higher grade, and so on. Um, there's other ones here. I'll put the, the whole presentation up on, the, on my website um, later on this afternoon so you can actually look at it tomorrow or this evening. My reflection. Hopefully my contribution to you is don't waste time that you can use in individual contact time in presenting facts which are already there. You can trust the students to learn. It's an interesting thing. You know, I used to worry that the students wouldn't learn. You know, students are students, aren't they? But actually, if you can infuse it, though, get them to individually negotiate that topic that they're really passionate about, they will work all the hours of the day. It's amazing what they'll do. Ask questions, pose questions, guide them towards questions. Never give an answer. You, know, you could even look at the theory of gravity, which is what mass one times mass two over something divided by something, and most physicists would treat that as a law, an answer. But think about it. Not everything falls to the earth at the same speed. Feathers certainly don't. I mean, a lump of metal goes doom. But a feather goes Rather than teaching them that, oh yes, there's all sorts of things like viscosity in the air and blah, 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 blah. Get them to work out or read about where to find out why a feather drifts down so gently. Or why is it you can drop a mouse from 50,000 feet, well no, let's say 10,000 feet so it doesn't fix it itself, and it will land and it will walk away. Uh, we don't do that. Why? Teach them questions. Find out why things work. Develop their skills, their analytical skills, their critical thinking skills, their research skills, and have enormously high expectations for students. Just because Rock Derby used to be number 100 or thereabouts, or 80 or something, in the league table, just because our students don't have enormously high entry grades, don't think of ourselves as, oh, we're bottom ends university, which we're not now, we've moved up a long way. Don't think of your students as just representing the average entering your type of university. Believe that they can do marvellous things. Convey that expectation to them. Give them the evidence that they can succeed. You see, this was all came out of a challenge to me from my pro, uh, pro vice chancellor when he saw these numbers. He said, have a look back over the last five, ten years, if you can. And I did that and incorporated it into that chapter that is going to be published later on this year, Learning Analytics. I tripped into this because I was looking at what am I doing. I needed an end of term module report to provide the evidence of what I was doing and show what I was doing. And it began to give me confidence that what I was doing was valid, that what I was doing was interesting and helpful to my students. Now, it means I can then use those learning analytics back at my new students say, hey, guys, you've never learned like this before. This is something different. But you are going to do amazingly well, and the average grades are X higher than most other modules. That allows them to trust me. The learning analytics approach can then allow you to trust yourself to go in this interesting and different direction, just like Anne-Marie's done with online, never touched it before. But you're finding the results are interesting. So we can use this concept of learning analytics to reassure ourselves and reassure our colleagues that what we're doing at A is valid, and B, maybe, if they'd like to take on this game, or this approach, becoming a skills of learning expert, not a domain expert. 
it's much, much more rewarding. It makes life a lot easier. All of my marking is done in contact time, scheduled contact time. I don't have the overhang for hours and hours and hours, mostly at my time. It takes eight or nine slides of PowerPoint, the same sort of density as you saw there, to do all of my teaching material for a whole week for a module. None of this 30, 40, 50 charts that we like to create normally as a domain expert for one hour's worth of lecture. It came to the end of its four megabyte section. <laughs> Interesting question. What happens to those who don't engage, who are not clever enough? Uh, it's kind of an interesting question to have to pose, and it's a very valid one. The again another part of the jigsaw puzzle about the success of my approach, I think, is that there is a tendency, we all as humans have a tendency to use stereotypes. I don't care what the stereotype is, whether it's race or whether it's ethnic, um, or whether it's home versus overseas, or whether it's the wealth distribution. I really don't care what, but we all have things in our head that make us prejudge those that we meet. Or whether it's just the assumption that oh, it's a, we're a bottom end or we're a top end university, whichever, or a middle one. Therefore, all of our students are going to be like this. Now, one of the things that I think I do, I don't know for sure, but I try to do this, is to meet every single student as an individual. I've got colleagues, and I'm sure we know of colleagues, who say, right, to the students, right, here is this assignment specification, just go off and do it. And then one of your type of students, you know, one of the less able, come along and say, sir, please could you help me understand what I need to do? Now, some of our colleagues will just tell them, it's in the spec, go away, go and do it. I'm too busy. That student will fail. If, however, we meet that student in their place of need as a person, as individuals, exactly where they need us, with no preconceptions, no assumptions, but as an individual, as an individual human, I think we can get better results. Now, you can do that with relatively small groups. I would shudder to do that with a group of 250 might kill me. Which is a bit like what happened with our, one of our online programs, which is an online distance learning one. Uh, the psychologists, 10 years ago when we first started, we discovered something interesting, that psychology students are more gabby than you could begin to imagine on the discussion boards. The moderation of that discussion board just about killed three lecturers. Not quite, but you know. Whereas on computing and business, they vanish into the little rabbit holes until out pops a completed assignment. I even tried tempting them with 10% of the grade from um, actual activity and contribution within the module. And they made a strategic decision, we'll forego the 10% and we'll do the traditional behaviour, out pops assignment when finished. Interesting differences. More contributions, though. Sorry, I have to talk too much sometimes. I think you said it all. Based on the question you just asked, every 
this student should be treated on an individual basis and you need to, to motivate them based on their IQ. Not that you just lock every student, all students <coughs> together. It won't work. I don't believe that there is no student that cannot be hurt. Every student can be hurt if we have the patience enough to help them based on the individual basis. Thank you. So my challenge to you, my question to you, not my answer to you, but my question to you is, are you domain experts or are you skill experts, learning to learn skill experts? You do that, you will succeed, more particularly your students will succeed. Okay, thank you, folks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let me go back to the beginning. I've given you a tiny URL to get to, to my website there. Slightly easier to write down than the full one. Or you just go to Google and search for Richard Self Derby University and that will come up at the top of the page almost certainly.